I didn't record any of that. Um, okay, so in this class, what I'd like to start with is going over the dialogue itself more carefully and stopping every once in a while so we can process the different issues that Plato works through related to what does it mean to be pious or holy or to honor the, the deities, the higher powers, what on earth does that mean? And to me, it's amazing because his dialogues articulate patterns, the different ways, the different issues that come up over and over again in every society. So I've taught students from many different countries and they really understand the pattern. And then within the US, these same patterns come up. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able the point of reading the great books is that you can understand why they're considered great. And that's because they touch on these patterns. And so you are part of the conversation. Like if you can educate your mind to the point where you can understand in the midst of all these differences and all this difference, there's this underlying stuff that just keeps coming back. And so then you are at that point where you figure out where the things that don't change and the things that do change meet. And then you can make better decisions about the future, right? Because you don't think, oh, I'm creating reality and it's never going to be the way, again. you know, forget it, you know. But on the other hand, um, it is going to be different. So the future will be different and similar at the same time. So then that's the point of this sort of education in books that are considered great. Now, you know, women can write great books, non-white people can write great books, non-Westerners, so it's not that kind of a thing. Um, as a matter of fact, Plato is mocking out the Athenians' cultural superiority complex, the fact that they thought they were superior, he exposes them all the time. So the fact that there are a lot of Plato scholars or classicists that really do have this superiority complex about the West is very ironic. Uh, but you know what? Uh, Plato's dialogues are chock full of irony. So let's, let's go for it. Okay, the first point, and then I'll stop and see if anyone wants to comment, is that um, Euthyphro, okay, they're meeting at the steps of the court. Socrates is notorious for not taking any um, cases to court, right? He doesn't sue people. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He stays away from that. Whereas other people, everybody's suing everybody for something. Um, and Euthyphro is there and he's sort of surprised that Socrates is there. And it's, and it's a synchronicity, it's this moment where these two things happen simultaneously that are sort of are revealing. And these things happen in history sometimes. Um, all right, so, so Euthyphro is prosecuting his father for murder, whereas Socrates, and he's a religious leader, and he considers his judgment to be what the gods want. Socrates is there because another person who thinks he knows what the gods want or God's will is accusing Socrates of being corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods. All right. So Euthyphro, a religious leader, says, well, that's not true, Socrates. You're a, you're a perfectly pious guy. Um, I don't know why someone's prosecuting you. 
Okay, so right away, you know, religious leaders disagree with each other, right? There's no common understanding of what the gods want. Um, it's also a younger person who's trying to get rid of an older guy, right? So you have this relation between the generations. That's a problem, right? Euthyphor is accusing his father. Meletus is accusing Socrates. So the young generation is, you know, getting rid of the older elders. That's always an issue, the relation between the generations. Um, let's see. Um, okay. And Euthyphro is convinced that he could convince the jury of whatever he wants to, you know? And he says, oh, I'm sure I could. I, if I were to go to court, I would focus on Meletus's flaws, you know, because like, that was a technique, right, for winning court cases, is you don't focus on what you did and what you're accused of. You focus on the character of the person accusing you. And so Euthyphro understands all the tricks of the trade in terms of winning um, winning cases in court, which was one of the major corrupting influences in Athens is that the courts were corrupted because people could act, could speak persuasively and convince juries or the assembly and wrap the city around their finger and get whatever they want. So Euthyphro really acts like he's one of those guys who can do that. Um, let's see. And Socrates is obviously not a guy who can do that. And he says, oh, Euthyphro, I mean, you know, let me, whatever. Anyway, he, it makes it clear that he's not good at that. He doesn't have any interest in that. All right. So the case against his father is a questionable case. And his father, at that time, in that country, slaves were property, right? It, they, it doesn't mean they were beaten and they were sold and, the, you know, it, all the things about American slavery aren't necessarily true about what went on in Greece. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody knows exactly how everybody treated their slaves, but anyway. So his father, um, the slave was, got drunk, killed another slave. Everybody Every normal, the normal thing to do would be to kill the slave. Um, but his father was trying to be kind of super pious by sending a messenger to Delphi. And Delphi was like the international law. It was the center for international law. So his father was, was going to make himself accountable to the international standard for justice. He wasn't just gonna do what he had the power to do and what the society would encourage him to do. He wanted to do what the priests at Delphi told him to do, which is, you know, very pious and at that time. Um, but Euthyphro, he, the slave died while the messenger was gone. And so Euthyphro decided he had to take his father to court for murder. Well, everybody's totally shocked. So what you want to think about is, have you ever witnessed any, any examples where somebody um, does harm to their, only to their family member in the name of God, right? Um, I remember, well, uh, parents wouldn't give their kids shots, right, vaccinations in the name of God. And so somebody would take them to court because they were not, um, you know, the, the child had a right to get the shot. Um, let's see, there were other Christian science parents sometimes don't give their children medical help. And that, that um, goes to court sometimes. So there are examples, you, you all can probably think of other examples where people's idea of God leads them to do things that family members would keep in the family, right? Um, all right, 
So I guess I'll stop there and just say if anybody wants to have questions or comments at the moment. Okay, so Euthyphro thinks he knows, right? Um, Socrates says, is your knowledge of religion so good that you really know that this is the right thing to do? And he says, well, of course, right? That's what distinguishes me from other people. Like my job is to be a religious leader. Um, okay, so um, let me get to, yeah, where he says he compares what he's doing to the holy books, Hesiod. So the story of Hesiod is a story of evolution, natural evolution, and cultural evolution. And so originally there was just um, earth and sky, Uranus and Gaia. And gradually then there were mountains were formed, rivers were formed, there were volcanoes, earthquakes. And so the earth started to develop a natural history. So there was a before and after, it changed, right? Which means it changed in time, okay? So one of their children was Kronos, time. And, um, and, and Uranus, okay, he, he also buried his, his children. Did I tell you the story before about Hesiod? I want to make sure if I... Did I tell the story before? I don't think so. Okay. Um, here's the story. Does anybody want to raise their hand if I've told this story before about um, Uranus? Okay. All right. So, not that we remember. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we just kind of glossed over it because. You know, there were people coming and going and all that stuff. So this is a good story. I want you guys to think about it because I want you to think about the difference between poetry and history or the, you know, what is art? Is mythology intended to be taken literally or is it intended to be taken figuratively, right? And that's true of all the books written in ancient times. So here you have, you have earth and sky, and then you have Kronos. Now they also gave birth, earth and sky gave birth to some monsters. And they had five heads, many arms and stuff like that. So now I'm going to ask you, do any of you know, and of course it's nobody at Lyon. It has to be 25 miles, 25 mile radius. All right. Somebody who's father especially, but it could be their mother, gets their ego caught up in their kid. And so their kid is an extension of their own ego. And so that's unhealthy. <laughs> Everybody has their own calling and they should find out who they are. Liberal education is about that. But so um, what happens when a parent gets their ego caught up with their kid. What happens if the kid is not quite as good looking as them, not quite as smart as them, not quite as athletic as them or artistic as them? Is that the kid's fault? <laughs> hey, you guys, turn on your videos. <laughs> I can't. If I don't have to stare at names, I really don't want to do it. Because then you can, you know, shake your head or nod your head or whatever, right? Is it the kid's fault if the parent, if they're not as talented or gifted or good looking as their parents? No. Is it, does it cripple the kid if the parents are embarrassed by them for something that they have nothing to do with? Yes. I mean, come on. Can the, not the rest of you, you don't have enough juice? <laughs> All right. What about if the kid is actually smarter and cuter and more athletic? 
and more musical, uh, right? What do, what do ego-driven parents do then? They show off the kids more. They show off. Do they? They might show them off, right? Or they might compete with them, right? I think it's safe to say they also lash out when the kid makes a mistake too. Like their okay. reaction of a mistake is worse than other parents would be. Very good. Okay, does everybody understand that that's crippling and that's unhealthy? And yes, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, so Uranus and Gaia had these children that were monsters. And Uranus was both threatened by them because they were stronger than him and embarrassed by them because they were ugly. So he buried them in the earth. Okay, so let's just assume it's the father that's got this ego problem and he cripples the kids. What does the mom think of it? Does she sort of protect them? <laughs> I mean, I hope so, right? So he buries them in the earth and Gaia has them inside of her. Is she sort of PO'd at him for crippling the kids? Yeah, she was mad at him, right? So she gathered all the children together and she had this sickle. And she said, okay, I want one of you to cut off his genitals. Who's going to do it? <laughs> This is great, sex ed with Dr. Beck. It's wonderful. Um, what does that mean symbolically? To cut off your genitals, eros is your passion for life, right? You should be erotically in love with justice or truth or virtue or beauty. All of those things you can get passionate about to make the world a better place. But Uranus is obviously passionate about power, right? And so she wants to cut off, so one of those kids got to cut off his genitals, right? <laughs> so Kronos, yep, mom, I'll do it for you, right? Because time is replacing Uranus. Okay, so then Kronos, he starts having kids. What's he thinking? <laughs> Is he worried that they're going to do to him what he did to his dad? Of course. Um, and psychologically, that happens, too. I've had students say in my office, you know, that, uh, you know, a kid who is rebelling against his dad is already anticipating having kids that are rebellious. It's kind of, it's pretty crazy, but it happens psychologically. So Kronos eats his kids. He devours them. So we even have that expression that you can psychologically devour your children, right? You're too controlling. Um, so then Zeus is born and he, he um, throws his dad in the, I don't know, throws him in the pit, something like that. But the point is that this story is a metaphor for this evolution to Zeus is the god of justice, and then you have Prometheus, and then gradually we move toward complex cultures. Um, but uh, Euthyphro takes it literally, right? And so he says, well, I'm not cutting off my father's genitals. You know? <laughs> I'm not doing what uh, Kronos did, so I'm not so bad. And then Socrates says, yeah, that's why I'm getting accused of being impious, because I don't believe those stories, literally, because if the gods are good, they don't do stuff like that, right? All right, so there's two different ways to read the holy books, right? Literally or figuratively. So I want you to keep that in mind, because I think that's true well, do people want to give examples in our own society? Does everybody understand that that happens with us? <laughs> Is there anybody who's lost or can everybody make an analogy or understand that that happens? <laughs> I don't know. All right. Alexis, you don't have enough 
juice to turn on your video? Okay, I've got to know who, who, who's, yeah, okay. And Giovanni? Uh, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I just, my video is not working right now because the phone I'm on, the front camera isn't working. Okay, Blaine? Same. Okay, Destiny? I do not have a webcam hooked up. Okay, uh, Haley? Yeah, I'm here, but um, the computer I'm using, the camera's not working on it either. Okay, so I do, I need to have some responses, right? So if you can't nod, say yes or no. <laughs> okay. Can you understand that there's still people that interpret the holy books literally and some of them figuratively? Yeah, yeah, I can understand that because there are some people that are like, they take every word like literally and they're just like hardcore with it. Whereas some people like when they read, they interpret it as like a general statement. All right. Yeah, we can have thumbs up or something. Well, I mean, there was slavery in the Old Testament, right? And during the Civil War, people used the Bible to justify on both sides right so the bible gets used quotes from the bible get used for just about everything and i think lion students should know that because lion students themselves quote the bible to justify a very different points of view um all right so that's what's going on in the youth of row um then he asks what is piety right and I think I'm going to go to the, the section that has the definitions. Because the rest of the dialogue is about the definition. Uh, piety is doing what I'm doing. Prosecuting anyone guilty of murder is sacrilege, right? Um, all right. But what's the problem with that? Well, that's just one example right? So maybe what you're doing is pious, but what is piety that would make another, what is it they have in common that would call, that we call one act or one behavior or one character trait pious and another not, right? He says piety is what's dear to the gods. Well, the gods disagree, all right? So in our society, people say, What's righteous is what's in the Bible, right? The trouble is the Bible disagrees. <laughs> I mean, you can quote a lot of things in the Bible. You can do the Old Testament or the New Testament. You could do Jesus or Paul. You could do, um, there's, there's so many books in the Bible. Um, the book of uh, Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, the same author, and he changed. <laughs> he had his midlife crisis, so he's saying different things. Um, anyway, so the gods disagree. Then, well, but what all the gods love, like you can find a common, you can find agreement. Um, and this particular case, right? They would all agree because you have to, you have to punish a murderer. The trouble is. Do human beings disagree on who's a murderer and who's not? Yes. We have first degree, second degree, manslaughter. We have blah, blah. We have if a woman has been abused by her husband and finally she goes and kills him, is that murder or is that self-defense or what is that? So yes, we disagree. So Socrates has got him into the point where he says, you know, he hasn't proven that in this particular case, all the gods would agree, right? People disagree. Okay, so what's the next one? Um, the next issue is, is something pious because the gods love it or holy? Is it because the gods love it or do the gods love it? because it's holy and I'm gonna make you vote, okay?
you have to vote and then you have to give your reason. Can you can you repeat the question yes, one more time? I will repeat it. <laughs> but you have to vote and then I'm going to call on everybody to explain their vote, okay? Is something pious or holy because the gods love it or in your case god or uh for Rossi, uh would it be what would be it's pious because buddha <laughs> did it or <laughs> or do the gods love it or does god love it because it's holy or pious everybody understand the question let's take a vote how many of you think something is holy or pious or righteous or religious or whatever you want to say because god loves it or the gods love it blaine rossi samantha how many think god or the gods love something because it's holy okay four sure you can do neither well you'll come in at the end okay so who voted for it's holy because the gods love it let's go who voted for that i, I voted for i think yeah i think that's the one i voted for i voted holy. for the one where where it's holy because they love it, not just because they do it. Because, like, I believe that in a sense where it's like, it's not not because they just do it, it's right, but it's because, like, they know it's right already. So they already love it because it's already holy, you know? Not, not just because they do it, it's like, yeah, everybody else should do it. Okay. 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 <laughs> Okay, they know it's right before they do it. Okay. Okay. All right, that's Giovanni. Who's next? The gods. Um, it's pious because the gods love it. Who wants to go next? Well, I think sure, you first have to be able. Oops, oh. you go. You can go ahead. No, you, you can go. I think to be able to establish something as holy, quote unquote, if you're interpreting it that way, the gods have to basically define what that is to them, or in a sense, for, I guess, Jesus' sake, what God told him, or I guess you could talk about the stuff that happened in the Old Testament, but I think it has to be defined first before you can necessarily go ahead and say that it is righteous and so on and so forth. And so I think by that option, it just kind of gives a definition of what it is. Okay. Okay. Who else voted for that? Blaine? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, I think my, my, my difference between theirs is um, not every God and every religion or mythology is good. For example, Hades in Greek mythology or Loki in Norse mythology, like they're both like according to most of the other people in the like the gods or whatever um, in those religions, they're the, the the tricksters or they they cause mischief. Like they're like even if they don't actually do wrong, they're at least the scapegoats. I mean, it's it was a long time ago, so things are probably lost in translation. Um, but as an example, one of Loti's uh, holy things or whatever is like uh, the snake, which a lot of people hate. So how, how is that holy? It's holy because Loti considers it holy because in Norse mythology, Loti gave birth to a snake. Okay, Egyptian set from Egypt. Okay. Um, all right, so... So then you would, it's pious because the gods love it. How does that go back to that? Well, because um, 
because Loti had a snake, it's the, the world snake. Um, Loti gave birth to a lot of really big Norse characters. Um, but because he had the snake and like this, that's just an example, but because he had the snake, he therefore loved snakes. And uh, because he loved snakes, he made them holy so that no mm -hmm. one would hurt them. Okay. It's interesting because the snake is a symbol for the um, goddess worship. So whenever you get a snake in those old things, it's always pretty important. But um, definitions change for every religion, and I, I don't hundred percent know Greek or Norse or like all the other mythologies. But right. So here's here's a question though: When you have gods doing all that stuff, is that supposed to trigger a blind literalism or is it supposed to trigger critical thinking <laughs> i think uh, it depends on the generation like how okay. like the time period okay so we'll um that's again that's an open question too all right who voted for um the gods love it because it's holy Four of you did. Where are you? Haley? Yes, I did. Go uh, ahead. I almost think it's kind of like a chicken and an egg thing. Um, I loves it because it's holy, but um, it's holy because he loves it. I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. It's an easy, it sounds like an easy question, right? And you're like, yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Who else voted for that one? Who hasn't spoken? Alexis? I got it for the other one. It's only because it's loved by the gods. You voted for it's pious because the gods love it. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, I think that, you know, when we have a mythos where we have a religion, the things that we worship in that religion or are central to the point of worship is because the stories and what's written by, you know, the creation force um, tells us how to worship it. So, I mean, I, for all, uh, Athens and the olive branch, right? They venerate that because Athena declared it that it should be venerated. So she kind of dictated it that that's why. So I think that's my okay. thing. But we already know that the religious leaders in Athens are disagreeing, <laughs> right? So, uh oh. Um, Aiden, did you vote? If I had to vote, I would vote for the second one just because the gods are supposed to like what's holy. But um, I think I'd actually go with Liam and Destiny and say neither just because not everything the gods do and like is holy. Okay, so that wouldn't be the reason something's holy? Right, no, that wouldn't be the reason it's holy. Okay. I think there's, you know, there's just more to it than what the god like is holy like what hope is holy shouldn't be about what other people like it should be from within i guess okay so do you think that um it goes beyond what any culture's religion developed it's yes, not, yeah okay okay um so do you think you could analyze any culture's um, religion as more or less um, sophisticated in terms of trying to educate people for understanding holiness? I don't know if you could really do that. I mean, I'm sure you could. I don't, I don't know. Like religion, it, it touches people differently. So like one religion might really hit me and I'm like, oh my gosh, everything is super holy but another one might, I might think it's just crazy. 
So it, I feel like that's more on an individual opinion of the religion. Right. Then the next question is, when you are critically thinking about these religions, when you have your opinions, can you get outside of the box that you only have those opinions because of the way you were taught and the way you were raised? So there's absolutely no way to get out of our conditioning? Or do I you hope think everyone would be able to get out of their box. But Okay. Okay, Aiden. Those, those are good questions. Um, who else was one of those neither? Destiny? I was, in fact, a neither. I do not believe that um, a god loves something because it's good or pious or holy, or that something is holy just because a god loves it. I don't really subscribe to the idea that um, you should obey a divinity that you can't understand fully. Um, and since not all gods agree, you can't really say that any of them are perfect by any definition. So um, just because one of them says um, killing people is bad even, and then another one says you can kill under circum cer certain circumstances, that doesn't make either of them right. Um, okay. from, from a human perspective, I think that morality is determined um, in relation to health of a society. So we created the um, mythos of these gods to explain and justify our own actions um, to each other, um, to give them credence. Um, and morality is sometimes situational. Okay. Do you think actually the whole realm of the deity is just sort of a substitute father figure? <laughs> That's what Freud says, right? I yeah. hate Freud. Oh, okay. So well, that, no. That's fine. But the idea is that, uh oh, I figured out my parents really aren't gods and they really don't know stuff. So there must be this other god in the sky that really has control. <laughs> that was Freud at his, you know. Um, anyway, I just wanted, I wanted to know if that thought has crossed your mind before. Um, who else? Go ahead. I don't like to just do the chat. Somebody should talk. Like, I want a human being. Okay. All right. So, Liam, go ahead. Just say what you wrote. Or, okay. Are you there, Liam? Liam says uh, he doesn't have a mic. Okay, so here's holy text can be interpreted in many ways. Look at the difference in Mennonites, Southern Baptist Quakers. It's the whole shebang. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, what else? A God neither chooses to love something because it's pious or make something pious because they like the thing. It seems like a duality, but in fact, a farce to cover the ambiguity of piety. Though it may be righteous to wage war in the Nordic faiths, it's impious for one to quarrel with a neighbor in Christianity. However, even within the same framework of religion, there are contradictions about piety or at least a quandary. Look at the Greek pantheon. Okay. There's no way to find the origin of a pious action. Okay. Um, let's see. And then Blaine says the chicken or the egg has a solution. There was an ancient creature that wasn't called a chicken, but it was its ancestors. All right. Um, okay. Anybody else that has a mic that can speak? So here's my next issue. If you think that 
the pious things are pious because the gods love it then your way of life is to memorize the holy books of your society right because if i'm going to live piously i've got to you know i have to read these books i have to know these books i have to you know every action i have to find a reference in the book to justify it or that would be what motivated it and then maybe you know in our day and age i have to read every holy book that's ever been written and memorize all of them that would be the one way right if it's pious because the gods love it you've got to read right about what the gods love if the gods love it because it's holy then what do you have to do with your life Miss, can you repeat the question i didn't understand stories for my english if the gods love something because it's holy what do you have to do you have to keep asking what is holy right you have yeah. to, you have to keep asking well what is holy what is righteous what is the good life and then whatever you decide is is you know and this is what i think if there is a god a god would want um so one of them represents euthyphro's way of life is his he his he lives that way because he answers the question that way socrates on the other hand has an entirely different way of life because he answers the question in the in a different way um does that make sense to people and rossi go ahead and chip in <laughs> i i don't really have much to share since a lot of is already said i just think that since i don't like buddhism doesn't have a god and buddha to us is not god he's just like a teacher and so i feel like something that we consider holy to me is because um we feel right and we feel that it is something that helps us to have a better lifestyle and that is what buddha has try to understand for years and so that's why we believe it's holy because buddha has walked that path before us to to try to determine whether it's actually useful for our life or not and so yeah pretty much that's it okay well the other thing rossi is rossi is really interested in environmental science right yes um and so and you connect that to your buddhism so why don't you explain that Um, so for for me personally, I think that Buddha has really like good teachings with the eight foot path and stuff, where we should be able to love everything and connect to everything, and to make sure that we live a sustainable lifestyle. And through Buddhism, I feel like people shouldn't waste anything that. is useful for another person and also um when we when we live we shouldn't like what we do every day throw trash away everywhere or um eat and waste food we should be considerate of other people who are, who don't have enough food or when we throw away trash we should consider about the harm that it's doing to other animals and so boda calls for us to stop doing that and to um make sure that the way we live is actually helpful and actually um considerate of all organisms okay and so I, yeah i think that's what is holy about buddhism and what i consider holistic okay so it is true that the history of christianity and buddhism are very different in terms of your attitude toward the natural world. Um and that's, you know, a big issue coming up. It's going to be a huge issue in your lifetime. But all right. So the main point, okay, Philippe, did you want to say anything? The main point is that there's two fundamentally different ways to live based on how you answer that question. Right? Or um or what destiny says you know holiness 
either, you know, it doesn't have to be some sacred thing. Virtue does not have to have this sanctity over and above just human flourishing. Is that fair, Destiny? Is that? Yes, that is exactly what I Okay. Mean. Well, you know, this whole class is about this stuff, okay? So the whole class gives you this chance to sort out all of these things. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Um, all right, so then the next issue he talks about, well, what kind of relationship is it? And again, um, any of you, Destiny, you don't have to agree with any of this, but you do understand it has a big impact on the culture uh, that you come out of, okay? So there is this idea of we're supposed to uh, attend to the gods, right? Attend to God. We're supposed to worship God. We're supposed to, you know, follow God. People are always saying that, right? And Socrates is say, well, what do you mean, right? Is this the kind of service that slaves give to their masters? Are you, is it a kind of God will kill your kid to test your faith or God, you know, beats you up just to see if you still believe or what is this, right? And then um, in, the, in the matter of slaves, um, you know, slaves serve their master because their master needs stuff to get done. But we don't serve the gods because they need us, right? We serve some view of piety because we need them. So do we attend, do we worship God for God's sake or for our sake, right? Okay, and I think, I, you know, I think people get confused about that sometimes. Um, then the next question is very important for understanding what was going on in Athens in the culture. So I'm gonna ask you, you have to vote on this and give your reasons. Uh, does the art of medicine attend to serve the doctor or does the doctor serve the art of medicine? And what does it produce? Does the art of shipbuilding serve the shipbuilder or does the shipbuilder serve the art of shipbuilding? What does that produce? And does the art of piety serve humans or do humans serve piety? And what does that produce, right? Okay, so everybody has to vote. Um, does the art serve the doctor, shipbuilder, um, or um, worshiper? Or does the doctor, um, shipbuilder or worshiper serve the art. Okay, who wants to comment? You wanna take a vote? I think they serve each other. I mean, you can't have um, one without the other. The artist enhances art by adding his creations to the vast collection of um, beauty and meaning. And art serves the artist by expressing his emotions, by letting him be understood, by fulfilling him. Okay, so what I'm getting at is what was happening in Athens, okay? If the art serves the doctor, does his goal have to be help? <laughs> if the doctor serves the art, then the goal is always health. If the art serves the doctor, what other goal might the doctor have? I think the question is flawed. They're not mutually exclusive. Right. It's just that, are there any people who go into medicine to make money? Primarily to make money. Of course yes, a lot there. of them. Well, that's um, the point. Okay, I mean, that's my point, right? But that is not necessarily, it's, it's still serving them, even if you personally think it's distasteful. Or there are many ways that a doctor can be served by his practice other than monetary gain, such as the fulfillment of helping others. That's, that's right. It's, that's, I'm not saying that's not possible. I'm saying, what is your primary motive? 
right to go into medicine is the primary motive to serve people and make them healthy or is your primary motive money or staff I like, or power i feel like for most individuals it's about the money and like after they get into the field and like they finally get to experience the other side which is like the helping people and like the more pure part that's when they they say like oh yeah this is what i enjoy about the job but like for the beginning most times they just do it because of the like the money all right so the main thing is that it's a matter of degree right it's just that when a society starts when people start valuing money more than anything else all of the arts and professions are corrupted. Does that make sense? You have your priorities wrong. That's all. And, and any job that you go in, really, there will be times in your job, whatever job you go in, where you might have to choose between money and the original idea, right? So, that's just, that's just one of those issues about life is that you ask yourself, why am I going into this, right? What's my primary goal? So it should be that I have a natural ability to do this, that I enjoy, and that I can do it for the well-being of other people, right? This is my best way to develop myself and also to help other people and to make the culture a better place. But if people take their talents and they start using them for money or power or status, then the system gets corrupted and also democracy, right, gets corrupted. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. But isn't the point of college that you get to find something that does both? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it is. So who said that, Blaine? All right, yeah, no. The, one of the purposes in college is that you can find something you really love. And because you have a college education, it probably requires enough expertise that you'll be able to make a decent living. Of course, there are always this, the weirdos that really love poetry and end up being starving artists. Um, but you know, that's fine. It's, it's just that the point of college is to find something that's meaningful and also you can have a decent middle-class life. It's, but does everybody understand that the question is trying to pick Euthyphro's brain to see if he's got his priorities right, right? And so he says, right, learning how to please the gods, uh, what do people, you know, do people go to church to flatter God or to try and control God, right? So the idea here, it, it ends up with kind of a business deal. Look, God, I'll scratch your back. I'll donate to the church. And then you can give me a happy family and a happy society, right? Um, do you think people ever consciously or unconsciously make business deals? with God or they go to church to gain points with God in the hopes that, you know, then the bad things won't happen to them? Um, do they go to church to network? Do they go to church to get a good reputation? Uh, <laughs> and so then the issues here are in the name of God and God's will, people disagree on everything, right? There's so many issues that people in the United States disagree on, uh, but they all refer to God, right? They all think it's God's will. Um, so that's kind of, and Euthyphro ends up with this sort of business deal, and, but he doesn't admit that he, that he doesn't know, right? He still thinks he knows. And he says, I could explain it to you, Socrates, but I don't have time. Okay, so, I mean, do you know people who think they know the will of God and you think that, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, people can get deluded. And um, sometimes, I mean, the irony is religion is supposed to keep you humble, right? 
the, the idea is that pride is a really bad thing and greed is really bad. It completely distorts people's judgments. Um, but sometimes religious leaders are the most arrogant and they and greedy and you know they're sort of they violate basic um standards of decency more than just the ordinary joe so that's that's what i think the the dialogue brings up so this one is about my friend hope and her child died and she didn't think it was god's will right she just talked about comments that people made that were helpful and not helpful. <laughs> um, but a lot of people, you know, deliberate about what happens when a child dies. Like, how could God let this happen or testing your faith or whatever? And so, um, you know, what would you all might agree or disagree, but how do you talk to somebody that, that you disagree with, right? Then we have this one about um, politicizing religion, you know, that it's a problem when you associate God with a political party, right? And then in general, um, at this point in history, and that was a while ago, 2003 or so, the different religions really focused on different issues, right? So some of them focus on, you know, forming a middle class poverty programs are a good thing. Other people say, no, it's the government. It's trying to replace God, right? So the environment, some of people who unite reason and faith will focus on the environment. Um, other people will not, right? Then war People on both sides religiously uh, have different views on war in general and particular wars, truth telling, um, human rights. Yeah, you have religious people, Black Lives Matter had people on both sides, uh, responses to terrorism and a consistent ethic, right? The abortion, capital punishment, all of that. So people claim to be doing what God wants and they disagree on all these issues. And this is a statement of humanism. Humanism, um, as I was saying before, just promotes human well-being and you leave God out of it, right? And somebody could say that, um, oh, I think this is basically the same as what my idea of God wants. Um, but other people would say, no, humanists are, you know, evil, degenerate, whatever. So Americans really disagree. And we'll talk more about this, but I just gave you a few documents at the beginning. Um, this one's about Noah, about what happened after 9-11. It compares it to Noah. Um, Noah got drunk <laughs> and God gave him, you know, gave some laws to follow after this. And so he says, um, yeah, we have to, we have to kill the murderers, but without becoming murderers, we have to defend ourselves without throwing out civil liberties, without overreacting, right? You have to do what's appropriate without overreacting. Um, and he compares that to the story of Noah. And then the, the reason I wanted you to read some of this was now that it's much later, right, than when these articles were written, what would you say about our response after 9-11, right? We're just obviously the Afghanistan thing is huge. But I do want you to get some historical perspective on it. And to say we had choices after 9-11 and in the name of God, people disagreed a lot about what we should do next. Um, because now, you know, you're just living with a history. We've just, we are creating this history 
of how we deal with these situations. And so you have to um, think about where you're going to position yourself or keep informed or be able to see things in a historical perspective. Um, whoops. OK, let's see. I'm going to try a different. There was another one, too. Um, I think this is the next one. Oh, yeah. OK, so this one is about bigotry in um, in the US. So the difference, I mean, so we have Arabs hate us, but there's also conservative Christians who really, uh, Billy Graham's son um, has said some pretty awful things about Islam. Um, and it is, you do need to know that in Africa, people are converting to Islam because they think of it as more egalitarian and less hierarchical because that's their experience of it as opposed to um, Christianity and the exploitation of the resources that Western uh, corporations engage in in Africa, uh, hospitality, charity. So I've lived with some Muslims in a Muslim country and I'm not gonna convert to Islam anytime soon, but they are, you know, they pray, they fast, they give charity, they do stuff, you know. Um, so the Quran can be quoted for any purpose. And um, all right, so let's stop there for a minute. Um, does anybody want to comment on the claim that there can be bigotry on both sides? I mean, I don't have a comment. I mean, I just, I agree. Is that, I don't know. What about your generation? What does your generation, what, what am I going to expect as you step into positions of power? Do you think your generation has, you know, outlived that kind of, <laughs> that kind of, um, polarization about Islam and Christianity, or do you think it's going to stick with you? I mean, I would say it's worse than it ever has been, the, uh, the polarization between the two religions. I mean, it's all over social media. It's, uh, I mean, I don't think the, the bigotry between both groups has always consistently been terrible since the Crusades. Okay, is that anyway? I anybody else want to comment on that? I um for for me, I feel like like I kind of agree with her in the sense that it is getting kind of worse, but I also feel like I mean it's hard to explain because at the same time it's getting better in a sense, but the only time it's where it shows where you can see like a clear like you can tell it's getting worse is when the decisions is not by us, but like of the people in power so like the world leaders so to speak when they make certain decisions where like you know and some somebody high in like these i don't want to say terrorist groups but like that's the name of them that's what we know them to be so like sometimes somebody in power may like go in a country where they're not allowed to or this that may happen and when these people make these decisions it causes like reactions and consequences and when these consequences hit by these people who are like retaliating which is their right then it shows where like people may blame their blame their religion and blame stuff like this but like i feel like over time it was getting better but every every time it gets worse it's because of like the world leaders doing or taking actions where they're not supposed to and the consequences usually are bad and that's when the so-called bad image comes Okay, anybody else? I mean, how do you want to govern, right? Do you want the country to be as polarized as it is? I mean, at this point, I honestly, 
I mean, even if you turn on Twitter, you can just see the cesspool of anger that different political factions have towards each other. And I think when that has become more normalized and actions and behaviors on both sides have become more normalized and stuff that you would have necessarily been able to get away with 30, 40 years ago, I think it's becoming a lot more tribalistic in nature. And so I think it's up to the governed to kind of set a, a certain you can't act in a way that you have to realize that you have a certain amount of power and that power influences people, especially the people that you put you into office in the first place. And so I think that when you look at those issues and the way that the elected officials act and behave with those issues end up reflecting onto the parties. And I think that's where you see a lot of polarization in that it's honestly up to the people to elect people into power that do not act in certain manners. And I think that that's not something we're gonna see in a very long time because both sides often have those leaders in power. Well, what about you as individuals, right? So the question is, um, you don't wanna go to work in an environment that's tribal, do you? I mean, I don't think so, right? So I do think if you don't want a polarized society, you just have to start with yourself, right? And you have to start with how, how am I gonna use the expertise that I have? How am I gonna treat people when I get a position of authority or it, right now on campus, right? So college campuses try to bring in people with different points of view and then they want you to learn how to get along. Does that make sense? I think personally that there's been a big kind of movement and backlash against the very much tribalistic nature among our generation. You can kind of see it kind of rear its head because people are just getting tired of it when it's constantly fights over and over and over again. And people are constantly angry. People eventually get tired of that. And so I think that you see people slowly moving away from that but then at the same time, it's encouraged by our media outlets, that anger and that tribalism. And so I think that that's used in a way to get those companies make money off of that. And so I think as a society overall, we promote that kind of behavior. But don't you choose whether you get onto that social media? Nobody's making No, I, I think you 100% do choose, but when you're surrounded by it, and that's all you ever really see, I think it can have a major effect on you even if you do choose not to be on it. And so that's how I think it kind of, I mean. It's just that, what do you do? I mean, do you passively accept it or do you actively try to write pushback? Mm -hmm. so just the fact that you're at Lion and you're in an environment that was designed for you to learn how to build bridges, right? so that democracy would work. So it's just an opportunity for you to make it work. And does that make sense to students? You really, I mean, the students are really set up to have to get along with each other in lots of different groups. You want sports groups, clubs, and then just who you happen to have for a roommate or down your hall. So it really is designed for you to learn how to get along. Does that make sense? Um, so anyway, it's, it's hard when nobody's, uh, Mike is working. Um, all right, an uncertain Trump. Okay, what happened after 9-11? Um, and the idea is that we could have um, come together as a nation, we could have, um, serve, you know, we could dedicate ourselves to something greater than ourselves and to start to improve, have less wasteful energy policies because the Mideast is what it is because of their oil, <laughs> economic and social strategies. We could have national service sacrifices. And there was a lot of call for that right after 9-11. Um, but is that what happened? No, you know, there's a lot of, there were a lot of missed opportunities at that point. Um, and so that's why 
I wanted you to read this because you live with the fact that we didn't, you know, move forward and find a way to have that event make us a better country, right? Um, all right, so that was that article. And then this is another one about hate, right? Hate mongering. And um, this one is about a general who, who, you know, said, God is on my side. And he just publicly said, you know, that my God is bigger than your God. And um, Islam's our Satan, right? And he was appointed, he's a general. And um, he, he would have to work with some of the uh, Muslim countries in the Mideast in his position as a general. And so the article says that, you know, that Rumsfeld should fire him, not, you know, he can express those opinions in his private life, but not in his role as a general, right? And so that's just something for you to think about, right? And um, I do think you should know, right, that we did have, we, I do think you should know who we appoint to head the cabinet and things like that. Who's running the country underneath all the um, daily events that happen. And then there was this one about somebody who liked Bush. You know, he said he sort of fell in love with Bush. And then he was disappointed at the way he handled after 9-11. Um, and he does believe in God too, and he couldn't figure out what was going on. And Karl Rove was, he would tell Karl Rove how to get Southerners to vote Republican, what you should tell them. And so he was really surprised when Bush um, allowed for our huge torture campaign in Abu Ja, however you pronounce it. Um, and so he said it was like falling in love and you couldn't, it, it was a hard for him to realize that he was going to disagree now. So he changed his mind, right? And so my point here is that in the name of God, people believe, say, do just about anything um, in our country. And so you are stepping in to history at a certain point and you're going to have people appealing to God for many different things because you live in the United States. Um, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, it had religious people on both sides and then it had secular people, right? So the, the course moving forward is helping you sort out all that stuff. And so some of you have a purely secular humanistic approach, which is perfectly legit. Um, I like to get as much of a mix as possible. And then some of you, I, I don't know what you come to the table with, but I do think we all know, I think all of you know that, that people in, at Lyon College really disagree profoundly about God and God's will and whether to believe in God or not, or whether the whole thing is a hoax, or, I mean, there's people who just believe God is the daddy in the sky. And it's because it's a kind of infantile point of view, right? Because a kid can never uh, re accept the fact that nobody's in control, <laughs> right? They have to believe somebody's in control. So they're like a little baby that lets God lead them or their pastor, right? Like sheep. So is that, you know, is it religious to be like a sheep or do you unite, do you unite reason and faith or do you just skip faith altogether? Um, all right. So 
let me just call on each person. It, it's so much better, you know, the day that we were all in the classroom together. I think that everybody would have talked and it would have been nice. Um, and I'm hoping, so each of you are gonna, some of you are gonna have to just type into the chat but I do also wanna know, is this gonna be true all semester or can you get onto a computer that has um, audio, right? I mean, it's really hard for me to believe that that many Americans don't have mics because you know, my EUW students, they don't have a lot of money, but they always manage to be able to, to talk. So can you use your phones and use the mics on your phones or something like that? Um, that's, it's important. Um, okay. All right. So Liam says he can get to Walmart and get, get something. I, I hope so. Or if you could borrow a computer or if you go to the library and use a computer there, there's got to be some way because I do like students to talk. Um, okay, Aiden, everybody needs to just sort of come up with their final um, reaction to this dialogue and to the issues of piety or religiousness or whatever. Um, I would say my final thoughts, let me think, on piety. Uh, I think I just emphasize that it's really, it should just come from within you, not from what people tell you it should come from. Um, I think that's just the biggest thing. And, uh, I do think like religion can be a good outline for stuff like that. And I think that's a big reason why religion is so popular because it, it helps guide people through, um, what's right and wrong. Um, but like we were saying earlier, I don't think you should just rely on your religion to determine what's right and wrong. I think you should do that for yourself. Okay. Um, Samantha. I think my biggest takeaway from this is honestly, the um, you have to unite religion and reason. I think since I was younger, I've been very much the type of person to unite religion and reason, but I think when one overtakes the other, it can cause issues along both lines. I think when it's just purely reason, everything can't just be explained by reason. And I think that you have to take leaps of faith in life. And then on the other hand, I think if you just solely rely on faith, you're losing reason and you are basically becoming a sheep that somebody has to herd. And I think the combination of the both allows people to think critically, but also realize that not everything can be explained in a sense. Okay. I will say that St. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. And now that I'm an adult, I've put away my childish ways. So there is even a Bible quote <laughs> to yeah. justify the critical thinking about the religion that you grew up mm -hmm. with as a child, right? Yes. Um, okay. Um, Alexis. I think my biggest takeaway from the class is uh, really more self reflective. I have not been religious for a really long time. So it's, it was really hard during this class to sort of figure out a way to define piety and morality for me in terms of religious context. So hearing everyone's thoughts on that was been really interesting. Okay, why did you give it up? Religion? Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. It's been a really long, I don't know. I guess I was just never um, convinced. I assume um, it's it's been like nine years or so since I've been on religious, so it's you know it's been a hot minute. I think it's just I wasn't really convinced from the evidence presented to me, and I didn't really like um, how the religious forces I had seen uh, had been influencing things around me. Okay, I mean because I do have pretty negative connotations towards the church in my community. So yeah, okay. I mean, before I came to Lyon, when I was 42 years old, 
I never met anybody that split reason and faith. Okay. It just wasn't a thing. And yeah, lion was different. So that's why I always ask students, like, why are you wherever you are? Because, you know, we have very different starting points. And I like, I like to hear the stories. And um, the, another thing, Alexis, is people's minds really work differently, sort of from birth, that they can't really control a lot of that. Um, so I was just wondering if you thought that about that. I, you know, when I was eight years old, I thought God was not a person. God was energy. Like, why would an eight-year-old, you know, <laughs> it's just something, it's a thing, right? It wasn't like me trying to rebel or anything, but um, I do appreciate Hinduism because Hinduism does acknowledge that difference and that's interesting. But mostly Alexis, just when you reflect on why you gave it up, whatever, it's just a way to learn more about yourself, right? And how your mind works. And that can help you figure out what you'd like to do as an adult, right? Um, professionally, does that, does that make sense, Alexis? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Destiny, do you have a mic? Yeah, I have a mic. Yes. Um, so uh, the thing I thought about most during this lesson was probably uh, about how I don't really jive with the idea that um, there's a perfect and unfailing divinity that we should obey without question. Um, I don't really think a perfect and unfailing divinity would ask you to obey without question. Okay. <laughs> So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, all right. And that's why that, do you understand why Plato's dialogue has that? It explores, well, what is this relationship? Um, okay, anyway. All right, Blaine, are you... Do you want to type something or are you able I, to? I have a mic. My camera's just a little weird. Okay. I keep forgetting who talked and who didn't. Go ahead. Uh, so my, my takeaway from the class? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I've always been really weird with religion because I've my, my opinion on it sways especially the last couple of years, because um, my parents were very religious. So I grew up in a Christian household. Um, but at the same time, like it's like uh, similar to Alexis, like um, there are good and bad connotations towards religion where I'm from. Um, but I do like how um, we talked about like, um, like we compared ancient religions and ancient cultures to today's religions and cultures and the parallels. Um, so, I mean, we, we still see that uh, humanity and like our, our human nature is um, still a constant in how we view religion. I thought that that was pretty interesting. Because, I mean, that's one thing that we can never change or take away. Okay, so... Yeah, especially religion often focuses on issues related to pleasure and fear, right? Because those are instinctual drives. Um, does that make sense to you, Blaine? That pleasure and fear are instinctual? Yes. And then that religions often tap into that? <laughs> yes. Well, um, there, for example, in, in Greek mythology, Zeus, lightning, people were afraid of lightning, so they were sometimes afraid of Zeus. So I, I understand, like, the, like, yes. Um, and there are comparisons, yes, and parallels. Okay. Giovanni? Um, for me, it's like... So when we talk about it, it's just like a, a learning thing for me and on like a world scale where I'm from. So the country I'm from, like how we view religion is like, 
it's not really like a, a separation thing where it's like it's like you learn to to understand everybody else's beliefs and stuff and try to like see the good in it because where, where i grew up where i live like our city is our population in our con- country is like only 1.4 million million people so like in your city you have like a, a church a mosque and even a temple where like hindus were, go to worship you have all of that in like in in the same like two square blocks you know like one street after the other so people like you grow up learning to like integrate and like just share values from other people and like learn different things but not really like criticize and like pick from it you know what country are you from uh trinidad trinidad and tobago very good um yeah that's great you know it's sad to me america used to be the the country that was tolerant and now like we're not there are a lot of other countries a lot more tolerant than we are um yes i understand (laughs) it's sad um indonesia is like that too giovanni they have the temple and the mosque and all this stuff yeah Um, that's nice it's where people you can live among each other and like not really be worried you know about hate or nothing yeah Haley what about you and when I was growing up I was basically taught to just think with faith and not reason and as I'm getting older I'm seeing the perks of thinking with both ways and you can't just you have to think for yourself not just what you taught um I'm seeing more and more of that okay well hopefully the class you know will give you stuff to think about. Um, Liam, he was the one. Okay, maybe he can type. Um, Philippe? Felipe? Is he there? Okay. Rossi? Hi, well, I'm sorry. Um, there was no electricity for a while. I'm sorry, Nate. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll do Rossi oh. first, and then go back to Philippe, and then I'll check on Liam's chat. Go ahead. So for me, my takeaway from this class is that I feel somehow um privileged to be able to travel as much as I do because I am not born to believe in just one religion because my, as you know, my household is pretty religious. Like my mom and my grandparents are all Buddhist. And so we are raised that way. And so I feel like my siblings tend to um, just follow suit with uh, Buddhist teachings. Whereas for me, I keep my options open. So I pick and choose what I want to believe in and what type of principles I want to follow in life. And I think that is the privilege of traveling because I get to, I get exposed to new religions, new traditions, and there's like diversity in wherever I go. And that's very helpful for me. Okay, Uh, Philippe. <laughs> well, Blaine, you do have to type it up. If, so it won't take you very much time. That's um, Felipe. Felipe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Miss. Do you have a final takeaway? Miss, for real, I was trying to support the class, but sometimes I didn't understand what did you, what. You were trying to say, and I feel like uncomfortable giving my answers because I feel like I am answering another another thing, and I am not talking about the problem. And for this, I mean, I prefer. Okay. You okay. know what I mean. But yep. I am for real. I am, I am trying to give like understanding the the class, but my English is still like <laughs> like like bad okay so that's fine um i'm, I'm just sorry Ms. no i'm just giving people a chance to do this today because we have a smaller class and um yeah i mean 
the thing about the class is I, I'd like you to learn from each other because as a generation, you're going to lead the country, right? After I'm yeah. old or dead or whatever. So like, I'm just a facil facilitator. Um, and I do really, for your sake, I do want you to learn how to get along and to understand each other. And, um, you know, it, just for your sake. So when there is an opportunity for students to talk to each other, that's that's what I um, aim for. Um, okay, so here's Liam. I struggle to acknowledge divinity whatsoever. I think uh, the first religion began with the consumption of mushrooms in the in the woods, and continued because people wanted a reason to believe they were superior to others and not just random chance. The European kings operated on divine right and kept peasants in line through threat of damnation. Romans used piety to encourage docile living. The Norse used religion to reinforce their raiding lifestyle, continues with each religious doctrine. Whether the religion itself is to blame or not is a question I don't have an answer for. However, it's a quandary like this that makes me believe practicing specific teachings from many doctrines like Buddhism, small amounts of Christianity, Islam, many more, will lead to a complete life rather than anything divine. Okay, that's good. I mean, this class is really about that. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I mean, my takeaway, I think, is that um, I think I'm giving you material that you can help you sort stuff out. And so by the end of the class, when you write, what is my worldview? Hopefully, you know, it'll be more than just having satisfied Dr. Beck or make her feel good because she's an old lady you should feel sorry for. And, <laughs> but, I, you know, the thing that's important about it is that I feel terrible that my generation handed you such a pile of crap. Like we had chances. We had all sorts of opportunities to give you a less polarized world, to give you less environmental decline. We didn't do it. So now you have to pick up and figure out how to cope with it. And um, so I think of my task as apologizing, but also saying, okay, I'm gonna try to give you some tools uh, that you can use so that when you do have to deal with people who are, you know, frothing at the mouth secularists or frothing at the mouth Christians or frothing, whatever, that you can find some way, some common bond, some common humanity that can keep you together because um, polarization can make people absolutely miserable, you know, for no reason right? Uh, you don't want to have to go to the gas station and have a sort of, um, what, polarized moment with somebody while you're putting gas in your car. And I mean, if people are polarized, every aspect of your life can just get to be a, a thing, an event where people are pitted against each other. And I must say that I I think the whole time I was at Lyon, I had a mild form of PTSD because I just felt so out of place. <laughs> so I apologize, but I just think it's so unnecessary because I did not, I really wanted to tell people, I really, you know, I have a lot of empathy. I want us to get along, but the, you know, there's this sort of, veneer of polarization and it's so hard to break through that but i i want to give you tools right so you could be able to do that okay well that's it it's time to go and next time we do the apology socrates apology it's very famous it's liberal arts at its best uh this is socrates is it aiden has to do this again but hey aiden 
you could think about what you, what are you going to get out of it a second time that might you didn't get out of it the first time. Really, you test yourself. Um, how have I changed since I last read it? Something like that. Is that okay? Okay. We'll see you. Have a nice night. Rossi. Yes, Dr. Beck. I just felt like it was so hard to talk to you as well as because really the the place that the students come from is you have this God, right? <laughs> yes. And it just is really the mentality is so different. So even when the students rebel, like um, Haley, they're rebelling against a kind of goodbye, Miss. Have a good night. Goodbye. goodbye. Or a kind of orientation that I think is foreign to you. Um, but anyway, was it of interest? Was it interesting? Yeah, it, it's it's actually interesting. Like, I'm sorry, I was like cut off like for about like 30 minutes there towards the end. I actually thought that you had decided it just doesn't have anything <laughs> to do with me. It doesn't click. Um, but no, I, I just.